بسم الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد Alhamdulillah, we've reached towards the end of this tremendous work. We spoke and we started a little late today. Alhamdulillah, the brothers, may Allah bless them and reward them. Had if thought here for the community, for the brothers here to eat and the sisters also to break their fast. So due to this, we delayed slightly in our lesson. Walakin alhamdulillah. So we have reached in the English translation. To page, which page are we still on? One hundred and fifty-two. We've reached in the English translation to page one hundred and fifty-two. So we've reached page 152. In the second paragraph, the statement of the author, Rahimahullah, or Shaykh ibn Abbas, Rahimahullah, as for the takbir for bowing, prostration, and rising from it, then the remaining takbirat, and the remaining tikbirat, then they are considered by some of the people of knowledge to be obligations of the prayer. This is the correct position because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam continually observed them, and he said, "Pray as you have seen me pray." And when he sallallahu alaihi wasallam admitted the first to shahud, he prostrated the two prostrations of forgetfulness to rectify this. So this proves that this was an obligation. So as we previously studied. In regards to the topic of the difference between a pillar and an obligation. As for a pillar, then if it is missed due, for, due to either intentionally or forgetfully or ignorantly, the person must bring the pillar. He must bring the pillar, right? As for an obligation, then if the obligation is missed, then uh, then as we find in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, that if the obligation is missed, then in place of the obligation at the end of the salah, we have what is known as sujood al-sahu, the prostration of forgetfulness. Prostration of forgetfulness. Tayyip, and we want to speak about in today's lesson, inshallah, when is it performed and how is it performed? Okay? The last paragraph, it says here, that which is most apparent and strongest is that they are obligatory if remembered. And they are overlooked if they are omitted forgetfully or out of ignorance. If he did not say the takbir when making ruku' or he did not say Allah responds to the one who praises him when rising from bowing out of ignorance or forgetfully, then there is nothing upon him. His prayer is correct. So now, again, understanding the differences between the pillars and the obligations. Uh, we see here that the obligation, if the person forgetfully forgot a certain obligation, right? And they completed their salah. فَلَا شَيْءَ عَلَيْهِ There is nothing upon him. His salah is correct. Right? And if he remembers whilst in the salah, then he performs the sujood as sahu As opposed to what? The pillar. If he forgets the pillar, then even after the prayer, if he remembers, it must be done. The pillar must be fulfilled. Right? But as for the obligation, then if he forgot it and he did not remember until after the salah, فلا شيء عليه, nothing upon him. But if he remembers while in the whilst in the salah, then upon him is that he performs sujood as sahu, the prostration of forgetfulness. 
طيب This next paragraph it says however it is not allowed for him to omit these deliberately if he misses them due to forgetfulness then he prostrates the two prostrations of forgetfulness meaning he cannot deliberately leave these affairs off the obligations he cannot say well khalas because it's an obligation i just don't want to do it la if he deliberately leaves it off he's sinful there's a difference but if he forgot it and he didn't remember until after the salah fala shay alayhi there's nothing upon him So now, Sheikh Al-Basi says, So all of the takbirat, with exception of the opening takbir, meaning what? All the takbirat are what? Are obligations. Except for the opening takbir, it is a? It's a pillar. Opening takbir is a? Pillar. Tayyib, quickly. How many conditions of salah do we have? Nine. How many pillars do we have? Fourteen. How many obligations do we have? واضح طيب so now شيخ ابن باسي mentions still on page 153 saying سمع الله لمن حمدا Allah responds to the one who praises him after bowing for the imam and the one praying alone say now what that this is a obligation saying ربنا ولك الحمد Our Lord, to you belongs all praise. This is said by everyone. Everyone meaning what? When it comes to the topic of a salah, to those who are praying, the people are one of how many people? Or one of three. One of three. The imam, either either he's going to be the imam, or he's going to be ma'moon, or he's going to be munfarid. Either he's going to be the one leading the prayer, the one who's being led in the prayer, Or the one that prays alone. And as we study through these affairs of the salah, we see that some of the rulings, and most of them, apply to everyone. The one leading the prayer, the one being led, and the one also who prays alone. The majority of the rulings apply to all three. And some of the rulings are specific to the imam, specific to the one being led in prayer, or specific to the one who's praying alone. Tayyip. Saying, Subhana Rabbi al Azim, perfect is my Lord, the most great, while bowing. This is four, meaning the fourth obligation. The fourth obligation. So the person who is in Ruku' is there to say, Subhana Rabbi al Azim. How many times? At least once. At least once. And it should be done in even or odds? In odds. At least one or three or five, hakeda. Saying, Subhana Rabbi al A'la, perfect is my Lord, the Most High, whilst performing or whilst prostrating, meaning in sujood. The person he says, Subhana Rabbi al A'la, perfect is my Lord, the Most High. And we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Aqrab ma yakun al abdul li rabbihi wa huwa sajid. The closest that the servant is to his Lord is while he is performing what? While he's in sujood. So make much remembrance of Allah in, in supplication. The saying, Rabbi ghfirli, my Lord forgive me, while sitting between the two prostrations. This is the sixth obligation. In, in, we have two sujoods in every rakah, right? In between the two sujood, the person is to say, Rabbi ghfirli, or my Lord forgive me. Rabbi ghafirli. So that was the sixth obligation. The seventh obligation is the first tashahud. Remember, he spoke about this in detail. From the prayers or prayers that only have one tashahud, like al-fajr or the raka'atayn of, of uh, entering the masjid, and similar. They only have one tashahud, Right? So that one tashahud, it takes all of the rulings of the final tashahud. Okay? As for the prayers that have two tashahud, like dhuhr, asr, maghrib, isha, then the first tashahud is an obligation. The second one is a, a pillar. The first is an obligation, the second is a pillar. While the ikhwan, how do we know this is an obligation? From the action of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
that on the occasion when he forgot to perform the tashahud, we find that he, the first tashahud, he did not go back to raka'ah and make it over, nor did he make over the salah, but rather he came with two sujood of, or two sajda of forgetfulness. So we understand from his action, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the first tashahud differs in ruling from the second tashahud. Because the origin is that there are commands. And the origin for the commands in the salah are that they are held to be pillars. That's the origin. Unless there is a proof to show that, it is lesser than that. So we have a proof to show that the first tashahud is lesser than a pillar, but rather it is an obligation. Also, the sixth, or sorry, the eighth obligation is sitting forward, meaning sitting for the first tashahud. As for sitting for the second tashahud, then it is a pillar. But sitting for the first tashahud, it is an obligation. Sheikh Ibn Basi says this is eight. All of them are obligations. If remembered and known, if they are admitted out of ignorance or forgetfulness, they are overlooked. If he admits them forgetfully, then he performs the two prostrations for forgetfulness, whether he is the imam or the one praying alone. As for the one being led in the prayer, then he follows the imam. So, the imam and the one praying alone perform the prostration for forgetfulness due to his saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, pray as you have seen me pray. When he admitted the first tashahud, he prostrated the two prostrations of forgetfulness to rectify this, pro- this prior to saying the taslim. Tayyib. Now, let's read, um, let's read these, these pages of Shaykh Ibn Uthameen. We'll go through them. And then we'll speak of um, some points in regards to the prostration of forgetfulness. Okay? So here on the translation, page 155, <coughs> Ibn Uthameen, he mentions, Rahimahullah, <coughs> every takbir except the opening takbir. So this, that what we're about to read, is an explanation of what we just went over. Just explain it in a different way. So reading it in two different ways, inshallah, will allow the information to be confirmed inside of our minds. Every takbir, except for the opening takbir, is a what? It's an obligation. The proof that the takbirahs are from the obligations is his saying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if the imam says the takbir, then say the takbir. This proves that this, that this remembrance is mandatory because a command dictates an obligation. A command. We know that in the religion, if we have a command from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or a command from Allah the Most High, then it entails an obligation. Unless there is a proof to show that it is lesser than an obligation. Ibn Thimim, he mentioned secondly, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continued upon this and he did not forsake it on any occasion. So we have from his statement, also from his actions. Third, it is a distinguishing statement highlighting movement from pillar to pillar. Because this movement is clearly a movement from position to position, and this requires a distinguishing statement that indicates this. Number two, saying, Subhanallah bil azim, perfect is my Lord, the most great. While bowing, you declare Allah to be free of all imperfections and glorify Him with your tongue. So, this is glorification of the tongue, and bowing is glorification through action. Therefore, the one bowing glorifies Allah through both statement and action. Allah Akbar. The one bowing, he glorifies Allah in his statement by saying, Subhan Rabbi al azim And also, he glorifies Allah through his action. Because the action of bowing in that is glorification to Allah. That's why he's not allowed to bow or to make sujood to anyone other than Allah. It is obligatory to say this once, and anything additional to that is recommended. Number three, saying... Allah responds to the, one who, to the one who praises him. This applies to the imam and the one praying alone. The imam and the one praying alone says, or they say, Allah liman hamida. So that excludes who? The ma'mun, the one who's being led in the prayer. As for the one who's being led, then upon the quote of, of uh, Shaykh ibn Baz and also Mi'ithameen, rahimahullah, that the one being led, that they do not say Sami Allahu liman hamida, but rather they say Rabbana wa laka alhamd. And in this passage, there is some khilaf.
Noun number four, saying. So he he went through all of the eight. So in Hamda we see that in his explanation that is clearly one, two, three is numbered. So we'll go through the numbers quickly. Number four is saying, Rabbana wa lakal hamd. Our Lord to you belongs the praise. This applies to everyone, meaning the one leading the prayer, the Imam, the one being led, and the one who prays alone. This is said by the Imam, the one being led, the one praying alone. Jayid. Number five, saying, Subhan Rabbi al A'la, perfect is my Lord, the Most High, while prostrating. He says this, and not Subhan Rabbi al Azim, perfect is my Lord, the Most Great. Because the mention of highness of Allah during this position is more befitting than mentioning greatness. Because the person is, posi- is positioned in the lowest possible place. For this reason, he praises Allah with highness. Allahu Akbar. Look at the of Ahlul Ilm. You see, subhanAllah, the importance of women understanding these adhkar, the direct connection they have to the salah. So the person at this lowest state a person can be, his face, his yani, and is known the human being that the most yani delicate and precious part of their body is their face. And due to the Prophet ﷺ, prohibit us from even striking the face of an animal. Because the face is in it, member al Jamal. It is the source of beauty. A person's face is where all of their senses are present. The eyes and their nose and their mouth and their ears. And it is glorified by the person himself and it is respected. And a person places that beloved, beloved face of theirs on the ground. And while they're in that position, they are mentioning the highness of Allah the Most High. And we know that Allah Azza wa Jal, that He is above us, that and wa qadran. That Allah is above us in His essence and also in His virtue, in His qadr. And He's always been above the creation, separate from them. So a person, when reminded themselves of how in need of Allah they are, and how lowly they are, and the reality of how lowly they are in comparison to Allah, it is befitting that they say in this position, Subhana Rabbi al A'la. Perfect is my Lord, the Most High. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And as is mentioned, it's referring to both the highness of Allah's self, meaning Allah Himself is above the creation, and also highness of attributes. That Allah is above them in His virtue and His status. The sunnah is to repeat this statement three times. And once is an, is an obligation. Number six is saying, Again, my Lord, forgive me, while sitting in between the two prostration. Once in each sitting is obligatory. And he says that at least once is, an, is the obligation. Number seven, the first is shahud. And the first is shahud, we said, is, a, is an obligation. And Ibn Uthameen now mentions a very important question that we discussed, so perhaps by reading it fast it will be clear. He says, note, if someone was to say, you've already mentioned or you already used the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud as a proof to establish that the last in shahud is a pillar. So how is that, or how is it that you are using it here as a proof to establish that the first in shahud is an obligation? Is that question clear? We've used the same proof once, to show that the last to shahud is a pillar. And we've used this same proof also to show that it is an obligation. How do we do so? Is the question clear? Because in general, the proof entails one ruling. So if we're going to use this proof, either both times is an obligation or both times it should be a pillar. So how is it that we use the same proof and for the first to shahud, when we use this proof, it entails an obligation. And in the final to shahud, it entails a pillar. How is it that? Ibn Uthamini says. The answer we say, Indeed, the Messenger wasallam, when he forgot the first to shahud, he never returned to perform it. And he, was, and <clears throat> he restored it by the prostration of forgetfulness. Meaning what? The origin is that yes, both the shahuds are pillars, the origin, if we did not have this other hadith. But when we have the hadith of the Prophet wasallam in his action, showing that he did not do the actions of a pillar, we understand that it is actually an obligation for the first one and not for the final one. 
Is that clear? Fight you. If it was a pillar, then it would have not been restored by the prostration of forgetfulness, as the pillars need to be fulfilled. If it was a pillar, the Prophet ﷺ, he's the most knowledgeable of mankind. It's known that the, pillar, the pillars of the Salah, they must be restored, they must be performed. They cannot be skipped over or left without being completed. So this shows here that it is a obligation, not a pillar. The proof to establish that the pillars are not restored by the prostration of forgetfulness is that when the Prophet ﷺ made taslim after praying only two rak'ah, two units of prayer for dhuhr or for asr, he completed the prayer and he performed that which he had missed. Then he offered the prostration of forgetfulness. Allahu Akbar. So on the occasion, the Prophet ﷺ was praying either dhuhr or asr, as is found in the hadith, and he had forgot to pray for it. He prayed it as two, right? And the Sahaba they came and asked him, "Has the salah been changed?" And then he said, "No." They told him what happened, and what did he do? Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He made up what he missed to show that those two rakah are pillars, right? The standing and the reciting of the Fatiha and the Rukur, those are all pillars. So when he missed all those pillars, what did he do? Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He made them up. He made them up. And inside of those two rak'ah, there's also what? Obligations. So the obligations that were missed, he did what? Performed the two sajda of forgetfulness. Is that clear? So in those two rak'ah that were missed, there's pillars. He performed the pillars. There's also obligations that were missed. So he did what? He performed the sujood of forgetfulness. Therefore, this shows that the pillars are not restored by a prostration of forgetfulness, and that it is necessary to perform them. So due to this, we say, when the first tashahud was restored by the prostration of forgetfulness, then this shows that it is, that it is obligatory, and that the prayer is correct without it, if followed by the prostration of forgetfulness. However, the prayer will not be correct if this was done deliberately. If a person intentionally leaves off an obligation, then the salah is not correct. The eighth obligation, the final, is sitting for, meaning sitting for the tashahud, sitting for the first tashahud. And that is, we find here in a footnote, the Sheikh Albani, he mentions, rahimahullah, that that which is needed to establish an obligation is an obligation itself. So to establish the obligation of the tashahud, one must do what? They must sit for it. So due to that, it also becomes an obligation. And they say in other books, that which follows a thing takes the same ruling as it. So for example, salah is an obligation. To pray you must have wudu. So wudu is also an obligation. There's many other examples. Now, the final portion it says, فَالْأَرْكَانُ مَا سَقَطَ مِنْهَا سَهْوًا أَوْ عَمْدًا بَطَلَتِ الصَّلَاةُ بِتَرْكِهِ وَالْوَاجِبَاتُ مَا سَقَطَ مِنْهَا عَمْدًا بَطَلَتِ الصَّلَاةُ بِتَرْكِهِ وَسَهْوًا جَبْرُهُ السُّجُودُ لِلسَّهْوُ وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَسَلَّمَ تَسْلِيمًا كَثِيرًا If the pillars are omitted forgetfully or deliberately then the prayer is invalid as for the obligations, then if they are omitted, if they are omitted deliberately, then their prayer is invalid. However, if they are omitted forgetfully, then they can be compensated by the two prostrations of forgetfulness. Tayyib. We have three phrases here. We previously studied if the pillar is missed, is not performed out of forgetfulness or intentionally, the salah is incomplete, it's invalid. Right? If it's left off, because it must be performed. An obligation, if it was left off intentionally, salah is not complete. If it was let off forgetfully, then it can be made up by the two sujood of as-sahu, of forgetfulness. Is that clear? Khalas, we'll read these last two pages of Sheikh bin Baz, rahimahullah, then we'll bring some of the questions. Sheikh bin Baz, he mentions, this is page 160. If the pillars are omitted deliberately or forgetfully, then the prayer is invalid if they are abandoned. Unless he rectifies this omission, then it is permitted to complete the prayer. However, if he omitted it all together 
and a long period elapsed, then he is to repeat the prayer. So the pillar. For example, a person did not recite Al-Fatiha. He can rectify that in the Salah. If he's in the same Raka'ah, he goes back and recites it. If he is in the next Raka'ah, then he performs the previous Raka'ah again. But if the Salah is completed, he's ended the Salah and some time has went by, then he must repeat the entire Salah. Is that clear? If some time has went by, then he must repeat the entire Salah. If he was praying, paragraph number two, if he was praying and did not bow in some of the Raka'at, or he did not prostrate, or he prayed without the opening takbir, then there is no prayer for him, meaning it is invalid. Or he did not sit between the two prostrations as he remains in a long prostration, or he raises his head, but did not sit as is sitting between the two prostrations is a pillar, compulsory pillar. So if a person did not say takbir to the haram, Allahu Akbar, then they did not begin the salah. Then they did not begin the salah, so the person is to pray over, and he must bring that pillar. Similarly, if they left off the ruku' and some of the raka'at, then also they are to perform the salah over. Ibn Basi mentions the same applies to bowing. If he rose from it, but he, but he does not straighten up and be in a state of tranquility after bowing, or he does not perform the last tashahud deliberately, then his prayer is invalid. If this occurred due to forgetfulness and a long period of time elapsed, then his prayer is also invalid. If he remembered and performed the missed pillar and prostrated the prostration of forgetfulness, then his prayer is correct. So, a person misses a pillar, right? He misses a pillar. Now, he's in two types. He missed a pillar and he remembers immediately. Then he brings the pillar and he also does the prostration of forgetfulness. As for the one that misses a pillar and some time passes before he recognizes or realizes it, then he must make the entire salah over. Is that clear? Is that point clear? Tayyib. For example, so he brings down more examples. If he admitted the bowing in the last salakai, then he was made aware of this, so he stood and then bowed and then completed his prayer, then performed the prostration of forgetfulness, or he missed one of the prostrations and he was notified prior to standing or he was standing and he returned to prostration. However, if he remembers that he omitted a pillar after this, then he performs a whole raka'ah as a replacement for this one, where he omitted the pillar and he prostrates the prostration of forgetfulness. So as we've been saying, and often, he missed a pillar inside of the raka'ah. If he's still inside the raka'ah, he makes it up. If he is now one to the next raka'ah, then he, dis- he discards that one that he made that missed the pillar and performs a in place of it. Is that clear? And also performs to do the sahu. As for the obligations, then if they are omitted out of forgetfulness or ignorance, then this is fine. This does not affect the validity of the prayer. That which, that which was omitted due to forgetfulness is rectified by performing the two prostrations of forgetfulness as done by the Prophet wasallam when he forgot the first tashahud and he corrected this by making the two prostrations of forgetfulness. The same applies if he forgot to say tasbih while bowing or prostrating. I mean, he forgot to say subhana rabbi al-azim or he forgot to say subhana rabbi al-a'la or he forgot to say oh my lord forgive me between the two prostrations or he forgot the first tashahud. And he prostrated the two prostrations of forgetfulness prior to saying the taslim. This is what is obligatory in this situation. This is what is relied upon from the positions of the scholars. The majority stated that this is recommended, i.e. the two prostrations of forgetfulness. But the stance of those who say that it is an obligation is both clearer and safer. Due to his saying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, pray as you have seen me pray. So this last paragraph speaks down about the ruling of sujood is sahu the ruling of the prostrations of forgetfulness. So Ibn Abbasi mentions that many scholars, they do mention that it is a recommendation. But the safest and the most clear opinion is the opinion that the sujood is sahu is actually an obligation. Due to what? Due to the general hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray as you have seen me pray. Is that clear, Khwan? طيب وبهذا ولله الحمد ختمنا هذا الكتاب النافع and with that by the permission of Allah we have completed this tremendous book so now we'll try to read a few of the questions 
that are found in the Arabic, the Arabic print of this book because they are connected to our lesson. So from the questions, is a question they ask Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, مَا الْحَالَاتُ الَّتِي يَكُونُ فِيهَا سُجُودُ السَّهُ قَبْلَ السَّلَامِ وَبَعْدِهِ when is the affair? When is it that the prostrations of forgetfulness are to be performed before the salam, and when are they to be performed after the salam? Qu- question clear? The two prostrations of forgetfulness, right? They're done at the end of the prayer. We've noticed that at, at times a person may do them before the suj- before the taslim, meaning before saying assalamu alaikum rahmatullah, and at times the person may do it after. So what determines this? What determines when did they do it before and when did they do it after? Ibn Abbas, he mentions, Al-Halatul Ula. The first. Sorry, he said in the answer, Sujood al-Sahu qabla al-Salam fi jami' al-Ahwal illa fi halatayn. The two prostrations of forgetfulness are to be performed before the Salam in every situation Except for two. Meaning what? The sujood for forgetfulness. It is done after the tashahud and before the salam, before the taslim, in every scenario except for two. Every scenario of what? Every scenario where an obligation was missed. Obligation was forgotten or a person did not know of. Not that it was deliberately left. Only what? Obligations. Not a condition, not the pillars. Okay? And also, the lesser than that, which is the sunan. They recommend the acts of the prayer. So we know that, min babi awla, that which is lesser than it, then also it is not entered into this topic. So only the obligations. The first exception, meaning that it should be done after, is, إِذَا سَلِمَ عَنْ نَقْصِ رَكَعَةٍ فَأَكْثَرْ فَأَفْضَلُ بَعْدِ السَّلَامِ لِحَدِيثِ ذِي الْيَدَيْنِ if a person ended their prayer and they recognize that there was deficiency, one raka'ah or more, I mean they miss a raka'ah or two raka'at, then it is better for them to do it after the salam due to the hadith of the yadain, the man that was, that was known as the man of the two hands because he was known to have long arms. And this hadith is found, it's a long hadith, is found in Bukhari and Muslim. The second إذا بنى على غالب ظنه بقوله صلى الله عليه وسلم في حديث ابن مسعود إذا شك أحدكم في الص في صاته فتحر الصواب فليتم عليه ثم ليسلم ثم ليسجد سجدتين. The hadith of Ibn Mas'ud. If a person builds, the, يعني okay, they're in the صلاة, they have some doubt. They have some doubt, right? Did I miss this obligation or not? And he goes off of غالب الظن. He goes off of his strongest thought. Meaning, a person's in the prayer, right? And he doubts, did he pray three or did he pray four? What is his strongest thought? What is he certain of? That he prayed three. He's certain that he prayed three, right? And he's doubtful of what? The fourth. What is he to do in that situation? Pray as if he only did three and bring an extra raka'ah, right? When he does this, this is known as bana ala ghalib al That he based his decision off of what he was certain of, right? When he does this, then in this situation is also better that he performs the two sajda after the salah. Due to the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, which is found in Bukhari, Muslim Prophet he said, if one of you all is doubtful in the salah, then let him seek out the correct meaning, that which he is certain of. Let him act upon that which he is certain of, and then continue from there, and then salam out, and then perform the two sajda. And then perform the two sajda. So in this topic, you do find khilaf in regards, yani some of the exceptions. Lacking there's, yani. If a person is ever doubtful, what is safe is that he does it before the salam. Because the ulama, they do different sometimes in regards the exceptions or, or in regards how they define when a person should do before and when they should do after. Lacking overall, if he does them before the salam, then there's no harm in that. 
if he did them all before the salam, then there's no harm in that. Is that clear, Juan? And the next question I want to read. Previously, remember, Juan, we said that those who are praying are one of three categories. Either the imam, or the one being led, or the one praying alone. This question is connected to the one who's being led. If the one who's being led forgets one of the obligations of the prayer, what is the ruling of this? He's praying behind the imam. And for example, he forgets to say Subhan Rabbi al For example, right? What does he do? يقول الشيخ ابن باز إذا كان مع الإمام من أول الصلاة فهو تبع لإمامه. If he began the salah with the imam, meaning he started from the beginning with the imam, then his ruling is the ruling of the imam, meaning he does not go back and perform two sajda, because he's following who? The imam. But now on the question of the following question. The question says, okay, now what about the person that was not there from the beginning of the prayer? The one that was there from the beginning of the prayer is clear. He follows the Imam and, and, and that's that. As for the one that was making up something from the prayer, Yaqul Shaykh ibn Baz, as for if he forgot an obligation whilst he was making up what he missed. He was being led in a prayer. He entered the prayer late, right? And now he's making up what he missed from the prayer. If he's making up what he missed from the prayer and he forgets an obligation, then this person, he should perform the prostration of forgetfulness. And similarly, if Ibn Abbas mentions if he forgot something whilst he was with the imam, but he is still making up what he missed. So for example, he entered in the third rak'ah, right? And in the third rak'ah, he forgot something from the obligations. It is known that he must make up the previous two rak'ahs. Then Ibn Abbas mentions that he should also perform sujood as sahu at the end of the prayer. Is that clear? But as... Uh, there's many other beneficial questions and يعني, we'll, we'll leave them for time and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to benefit from that which we learned in this lesson, in these lessons, to allow it to be heavy upon our scales on the day when we meet him. On the day when on the day where it would not matter, would not avail us, would not aid us, our wealth nor our children, except for those who meet Allah with a sound heart. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those healthy sound hearts. I encourage your brothers and sisters, those present and those not present. That this is a, and alhamdulillah, it's a short risala, beneficial book. It is not يعني, from the most detailed of books in the topic of a salah, nor, is, nor should it be the only book a person studies. But rather, we encourage your brothers to also study books like Sivat al-Salah by Sheikh al-Albani, rahimahullah, and also Sivat al-Salah by Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, and other books that discuss of this time have authored in this topic of a salah and that they try their best to ponder upon these affairs and try to perfect them to the best of their ability and that we give concern to knowledge in general for indeed we know that knowledge precedes statements and actions 
and that Allah has raised in virtue of those who have knowledge and those who believe. And that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has said, طَلَبَ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمْ Seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. The scholars, they say, explaining this hadith, is an obligation that a Muslim must have the knowledge of all of the affairs in which necess- that he is commanded to perform of deeds. So any acts of worship, any acts of worship that a person is obligated to perform, then it is an obligation for that person to learn with knowledge how to perform those deeds. Whether it is the salah, or fasting, or hajj, or charity, or any of the other obligations of the religion. So let us take that serious. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Jazakumullah khair. Allah yahfadhkum.